Times and her son Kenny were facing charges for the murder of an elderly socialite and were suspected of carrying out at least two other killings. The media has so far portrayed us totally like we are not. We're just a mother and son. In a way, they're the perfect crime team. She was the, the brains behind the operation and he was the guy that was sufficiently big and muscular to actually do the dirty work. Shantae's eldest son, Kent, grew up surrounded by his mother's crimes. I knew about the cars, I knew about the shoplifting, you know, I knew about some of the scams we were trying to run and stuff. You know, I, I knew they were up to no good. But the thought of murder never crossed my mind. Thinking about family members, their loss, their grief, and their trauma oftentimes gets overlooked because they sort of get bundled up with the perpetrators and they get forgotten as actual victims themselves. I still love them today as much as I ever have. I'm, a, I'm ashamed of what they did. Um, it goes against everything I believe in as a Christian but I still have the same love for them in my heart. Shante Kimes was born in 1934, but even to her family, her past was mysterious. My mother's uh, childhood is a blur, and I think it always will be, because there's just been so many stories told uh, through the years, and there's been so many fabrications, it's really hard to dissect it to find out what the truth is. Recently, um, I was found by a long-lost cousin, of all things, and uh, she's into genealogy. And she actually knew more about my mother's childhood than I did. And found out that mom was basically a street kid in Los Angeles, as far as we know. She used to steal cheese from food stalls to, to survive. And um, it was during these years as a, a street urchin that she became acutely aware of the huge disparity between the wealth of Hollywood and the harsh reality of her own life. And this made her want to be someone and to rise in the world. And that had a deep influence on her moral compass as life went by. At one point, she said we were French, and then we weren't French. Um, Another thing is, too, is she always said that we came from, like, a royal bloodline in uh, India. And so she would always call me her little princess. And I didn't really believe that. I was just like, oh, she's just being sweet, you know? But she was, like, like demanding on it and, like, determined to make me believe that. Was there a nugget of truth in there? What a confusing concoction of storylines to try and make sense of who am I in relation to this woman and who is she in relation to me? She really was two different people because uh, the mother figure uh, was great, you know, fantastic. She could be very sociable, very welcoming, very affectionate, actually. But when the criminal Shantae came on stream, she was something completely different, totally ruthless in pursuit of whatever it was that she wanted at that time. As far as shoplifting, she never made me shoplift. She tried to get me to do it, but just, eh. But she showed me how to make money. She goes, here's what you do, here's a quarter. So I went, and she goes, go buy some the newspapers. And so I put the quarter in, instead of taking out one paper, she took all the papers out. And then she'd have me sit in front of the store and sell the papers you know, for pocket money. If a parent is coming across as uh, chaotic, um, destabilizing, um, all over the place at times, loving at other times, 
What can a child really do? They are in a powerless position. He's caught as a child in her web. She ultimately regarded theft as simply part of what life was all about. And she used to steal fur coats from stores. She'd steal the best looking luggage from airport carousels. Um, she would just routinely shoplift. One time, mom was quote shopping, <laughs> and I'm sitting on the hood of her car. All of a sudden, mom is running out the door with bags in her hands. He said, get in the car, get in the car. So I stood up, and by the time we got there, the store manager caught her. So you stole those dresses, and you know, you, you're not going no place. Mom started getting me, I'm so insulted, you accused me of doing that and stuff like that. And then we started hearing the sirens. I was like, uh-oh. And uh, mom, I remember mom looking. I, I remember seeing the twinkle in her eye. It, it wasn't a planned out deal. It was just a reflex. And she balled up her fist, and she punched me in the mouth as hard as I've ever been hit and since her before. My lips split open. I saw the scar and feel on the inside. Blood's gushing out. The cops jump out of the car, and mom starts saying, this hit my son, accused the manager of hitting me when she's the one that did it. How can you possibly do that? You're supposed to be a parent. But I don't think somebody like Shantae necessarily sees people in that way. She sees people as, these are objects that I can move around and use. So this is for her own personal gain. Police said, well, we need a question. I said, no, I'm taking my son to the hospital. I'm taking my son to the hospital right now. And she throws him in the car, she gets in the car, drives out the driveway. The hospital's to the left. She takes a right. <laughs> and uh, we stop at one of her doctor friends, and he stitches me up in his, in his living room, and then we go home. So she got away with it. And she, and the thing is, she got to keep the dresses. She threw them in the back seat. <laughs> It wasn't just theft Shantae was involved in. She always had a con on the go. And from an early age, she involved Kent. When I was younger, I was small. You know, I could fit through windows. <laughs> so, and mom wouldn't make me take valuables. She wanted me to get papers all the time. She was quite well informed on how to forge documents, um, create fraudulent signatures, and all the other things that were required to be a successful con woman. She was a beautiful woman. Um, she always looked really classy, always wore white. She had this big, beautiful black wig. <laughs> and it just, it looked good on her. And when she would walk into a room, I mean, it went one way or the other. One. Everybody just got excited. It was just like everybody was lit up, you know? Um, and then there were other times when it was just terrifying when she would come into the room. All of her relationships were basically based on the same formula, which that she was the domineering character, and they were the, um, the guys who went along with everything she said. There's not one man that she met didn't have to tell me how beautiful my mother was. You know, I know, okay, fine, she's she good looking, that's good. But she just had that kind of charisma. In 1970, in Los Angeles, Shantae set her sights on property millionaire Ken Kimes. He was simply unable to get out of her grasp. It was simple as that. I mean, he was a very insecure fellow. It made him feel like a king. You know, it just showered him with attention. And it was, it was just simply her reeling in her millionaire. It worked. She did. The thing was, it was crazy is that my stepdad's a multi, multi, multi manor. Mom's still shoplifting groceries. Suspicion doesn't usually fall on multi millionaire wives and stuff like that, you know? And she played it to the hell. Shanti is on record as saying that uh, why should I steal other people's money uh, when we've got so much ourselves? We're loaded. That's the term she used. We're loaded. So why should I steal from anyone else? 
Eventually, Shantae's love of crime rubbed off on Kent. This is a uh, house where Mom, Ken, and I became a family. Uh, it wasn't a huge house, but uh, the location, incredible. Um, it was nice. It was really nice. This is a house we lived in when I got busted for stealing surfboards. So that was a... Uh, that was an eye-opener, you know. I uh, got caught stealing surfboards. And dead to rights, horrible thing to do. Well, I got home from school the next day, and the wrath exploded. You know, I was getting cussed out, you and all this stuff. And I said, Mom, I'm sorry. I'll never steal anything again. He said, I don't care if you steal anything. Just don't get caught. I'm like, whoa. And, and I, I was... Young enough then not to understand, but old enough to understand that this, there's something going on here. This isn't right. From his point of view, psychologically, that is really messed up. You know, what is right? What is wrong? And I know what's right from wrong, but this adult is saying, no, just never get caught. Very confusing message. When I got in trouble for that, that was the end of my criminal career. Um, you know, this. I, you know, the words defining moments, it's, it's so overused. But for me, it was, you know, at the time, I, I hated it. I'm still ashamed of it. But in some ways, it might be the best thing that ever happened in my life. Although it was the end of Kent's criminal activity, when his younger brother arrived, Shante had a new protege, and the two of them ended up killing together. Kenny made Mom more dangerous. Mom was plenty dangerous before Kenny turned into what he became. But... As far as I know, there wasn't premeditated murders, crimes of this intensity before they became partners. But Kenny brought an intensity that took her bad qualities and made them fierce. For conwoman Shante Kimes, wealth and a waterfront home were not enough. Her husband Ken needed to be more than simply a millionaire. She had images of grandeur in her head. She was acutely aware of status all the time. She was very impressed by anybody who had a title. She got letterhead that made it sound like Ken was a bicentennial ambassador. You know, and, and it worked. So all of a sudden, when they made reservations for dinner, it wasn't Mr. Kimes, it was Ambassador Kimes. You know, and it worked. We got nice tables and stuff. They actually met Gerald and Betty Ford on one of the occasions when Ken uh, was in his ambassadorial role, and he actually introduced himself to the Fords as an ambassador, when, of course, he wasn't an ambassador in any real sense. And there's a famous photograph of them with the Fords where uh, Ken and Shanta are trying to ingratiate themselves with the Fords. And the Fords uh, are looking on with barely disguised disdain. This fed into the persona that she wanted to create. Now that she'd achieved an exclusive lifestyle, Shante Kimes was determined to hang on to it. She had a plan. Mom was gone for a while. I didn't know where Mom was at. I had no idea. And uh, well, I got home from school, and there's Mom. And she sits me down and says, I got some really good news for you. You're going to be so excited. And with Mom, at that point, I'd learned that good news for her wasn't always good news for me. What is it? She goes, you have a little brother. Go, what? This is real. And I got mad. It's one time I blew up because I said, people don't live like this. This isn't the way you find out you got a brother. I mean, this, don't you see how weird this is? Once Kenny was born and brought home, um, things did calm down a little bit. Ken was a very doting father, but still you knew that the reason why mom got pregnant was to have the heir to his fortune gave her the, the power to, to control his money in case anything happened. 
He has a, a, a very different upbringing, I think, to Kent. From Shante's perspective, Kenny can do no wrong, but he also appears to be being raised in a hermetically sealed world that she has full control over. You know, she chooses who his friends are. He's homeschooled. He's kept very, very close to her. I love playing the role of bigger brother. You know, there was 12 years difference between us. So it wasn't like we're bonding like most brothers do. But I had a lot of fun, and he had a lot of fun. I loved my uncle very much. Um, he was a little crazy. He liked to play pranks. Um, I do remember he liked to jump off the roof and jump into the pool, which was crazy. But I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Kenny had an unreasonable expectation of what he was entitled to. Um, he didn't know you had to work for a living. He, he thought you can get whatever you want. It was okay to steal from people. Shante behaves in ways around him that are all about uh, rule-breaking, mistreating others. So he's witnessing all of this stuff. And guess what children do? They learn from their parents. When Kent got married in 1983, he extricated himself from his family and became a father for the first time. Mom was just getting too crazy. And I went off and uh, ended up in the army on my own. I hadn't talked to mom for almost a year. And she didn't even know that, that my daughter was born. And then phone rings, there's mom. And they're in town. They say, hey, yeah, we can come see you. And, well, I got some news for you. <laughs> you know, so you're your grandmother. I called her grandma, um, but I also called her Babish. I know she loved being a grandmother. She she went full out on gifts and making you feel loved. They had the, the most fun, loving grandma, fun grandmother was. Kenny was bigger than life, always laughed and stuff like that, easy to play with. Um, they, they worshipped him. One of my favorite memories of her, it was on my 10th birthday, and I got really excited because I knew she was about to do something cool. I pulled on my house, I hit the garage door opener, and there's a horse sitting in my parking spot. I went, what? My mom went out and bought a horse for her birthday without even talking to me about it. Babish, she had a glass of champagne and was trying to give it to the horse, and we winded up naming the horse Champagne and Ribbons. So that one was was really cool. It was awesome. I I miss her. <laughs> I think somebody like Shante is a huge con artist. There's a lot of misdirection here. You're busy looking at the pretty things that she's giving you, and she's misdirecting you from what she's actually up to and how she's actually using you to get what she wants. I have a lot of good memories with mom. But one of the ones that illustrate to me just how loving she could be was uh, we were in the Bahamas. And uh, my daughter was pretty young at the time. She was upset because she couldn't find any uh, shells on the beach. She saw me and how sad I got. And the next morning, she told me, like, She's like, go look for some more shells. And I was like, no. And she's like, no, 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 go, go, go. And so I went and found the most beautiful, exotic shells. You know, they were just gorgeous. Mom went down to a store and she bought a big bag of seashells and she sprinkled them on the beach and woke up the next morning and told my daughter, hey, shells on the beach. When she did stuff like that, I mean, I know she was doing it out of love and to be sweet, but I actually believed her, you know? So I thought that there really was magic, and, you know, I really thought all these other things that she told me, um, and I, it kind of, con it, it confused me a lot. I think what we see with Shantae is her over-the-top gestures of generosity, which 
you know, when you're a, the child of or the grandchild of somebody like this, you see that as markers of, of love and affection. Look at what I've done for you. And these huge displays, I think, have a darker underbelly because I think they're conditional. I do this for you, and what are you going to do for me? One thing that my grandma did is she was telling me there was this mean lady um, laying on the beach. And she said, that's a mean lady, Christina. And she's like, I need you to do something for me. And I was like, what, what? And she was like, I want you to go over and I want you to grab her um, headset and her cassette player. I want you to grab it and I want you to run back here as fast as you can. And I was like, okay, you know, really confused. And she was like, I'll give you $100, like that. And I was like, okay, like that. <laughs> um, I just I just didn't understand. She kind of turned it into like a game even. Um, and so I was, by the time I went over there um, to the poor lady, um, I was kind of giggling and laughing and I winded up grabbing it and I ran as fast as I could back to the house. The lady was so mad, so angry. She came up to the house, started banging on the door. Um, and then I got really scared. And I was just like, uh, you know, I was terrified. And then Babish went and talked to her and started yelling at her. And then she came over to me and she was like, I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. You did a great job. Having spent her whole life conning, manipulating and stealing, in pursuit of anything that took her fancy. Amazingly, Shante Kimes had never faced the consequences. Mom had gone to, to court several times, but with her charisma, her ability to lie, to, to sway people, they never can get a conviction, no matter what. No jury would convict her. In 1985, that changed. I was in the Army, a helicopter pilot, and I got a phone call from Kenny, and he's hysterical. I've never heard him so hysterical. I said, what's going on? And Mom and Ken just got arrested. Mom and Dad. I go, what? what? She was first uh, in prison for five years for enslaving Mexican maids. That was her first actual um, offense, as recorded in, in a court. The other side of Shanti was obviously she was a thoroughly nasty piece of work. And uh, she would get quite wild with them and become uh, really nasty. And uh, she also physically restricted their freedom, which is where the enslavement bit came from. She was effectively using them as unpaid labor. Mom had made the papers many times. She made the news, but she was never the headline. You know, she was never the big story of the day. She was this time. Ken Kimes took a plea bargain to avoid jail while Shantae was imprisoned for five years. This wasn't to be the last time she'd make the headlines. Soon, it would be for murder. She really uh, sprang to worldwide prominence in 1998, after she and Kenny had murdered Irene Silverman in New York. And uh, that's when it became a really big story. And when the, um, uh, all the details of their con and kill schemes came into the open. In 1994, Shantae's millionaire husband, Ken Kimes, suffered a sudden aneurysm and died. She goes, Ken, there's no will. Uh-oh. You know, I wasn't so worried about myself because I was a fairly successful businessman and stuff. But then I thought, okay, if she's destitute, where's it going to fall on? Me. And what she did she got into safe deposit boxes, went through the accounts, and there was no money. It was gone. Not being able to find the missing millions, Shante and Kenny Kimes still had the house, but nothing else. The only money that we actually found, um, I, I took a, a jacket of Ken's just to remember him by. I just happened to reach in my pocket and pull out a, a, a bank book. It was about 500000 So I gave it to her. 
I guess that was a seed money. I don't know how she got it. But it was a Bahamas account. For two years after his death, she did try to keep him financially alive. And uh, that's when the uh, Gulf Union Bank in the Cayman Islands became very interested in the activities taking place on uh, Ken Senior's account. Christina was a, a pawn for them a couple times. In fact, uh, one time they were taking her to the Bahamas. I don't know how they talked me into doing this. I was really excited and we were checking in through the uh, security part and then all of a sudden, things just got really weird. People, you know, were kind of skittish, some people running around. Um, I remember looking behind me to see where my grandmother was and my uncle, and they were nowhere to be found. And um, I was really scared. I was really scared. I walked over to a pay phone that was really close to it and I called my mom and then I see this cop um, and he starts walking towards me quickly and he's like hang up the phone and so you know without thinking I just of course hung it up and he immediately asked me you know where's the people with this bag or, or something like that and I was like I don't know I, I can't find them they find a taser in Kenny's luggage. And mom and Kenny take off and just left my daughter there. It was one of the most horrible experiences of my life. You've got to imagine what kind of mentality it takes to leave a child in that position. From my point of view, looking in, these are people who don't care about the fact that this is a child. They, their sole focus is about themselves, their own safety. They never apologized to me for leaving me there like that and abandoning me. Um, but I thought that was normal. I thought it was normal to go from being super, super happy and excited and high on life, and then all of a sudden it's misery. Christina had a lucky escape. That trip to the Bahamas is believed to be the first time that Shante and Kenny Kimes committed murder. Mr. Ahmed was a, a senior official with the Gulf Union Bank, and uh, he flew to Nassau to investigate activities taking place on uh, Ken Senior's account. According to Kenny's account, because he was the one that eventually fessed up to the, the murder of the banker, they, they all went back to the house, they had a coffee. They'd by that stage recognised that the bank was going to be a major obstacle for them. Um, and so they decided together to dispose of him. A date rape drug was dropped into his coffee. One of them filled the bathtub. They dragged him in a semi-comatose state into the bathroom and plunged him into the bathwater and held him under. Bank official Mr. Syed Bilal Ahmed's body has never been found. Before his disappearance could be linked to them, Shante and Kenny Kimes returned to the United States. By 1997, they were destitute and Kent took them in. At first, it was the three of us, the three amigos, you know. But the more I resisted what I knew was not right, and they were making financial mistakes, uh, Kenny was shoplifting like crazy, Mom was shoplifting like crazy. I caught him going through the drawers of the house. Um, I had a meeting I had to go to, and I walk in my office, and, you know, Mom's sitting behind my desk, the drawers are open, and they're both glaring at me. This is when things were... Not good. The tension was building. And towards the end, I didn't try. That's why I kicked him out of the house. I, I, I got tired of hide, hiding my ID, you know, and telling, you know, getting locks on the, on the back or the bedroom doors to lock them and stuff, not trusting them. He remembers the last time that he saw them together. I saw them alone once on New Year's Eve. We had a drink by my office. And I remember 
as I'm pulling away, they're still in the parking lot, and I could see in the rear view mirror mom crying. <laughs> Next time I saw them, they were behind bars. When Kenny and Shantae left Kent, they went in search of their next money-making scheme. News of a wealthy widow caught Shantae's interest. They were in the process of crossing America, and, and the, they got word of this, this woman, Silverman, and the attractive mansion in a posh part of Manhattan. And that became their, their target. Under a pseudonym, Kenny Kimes rented a room from Mrs. Silverman. It's a very nice terraced uh, mansion. And that was in Shantae's sights. She wanted it. That's precisely what she wanted in life. And she actually fooled herself into believing that she could get it by scamming the documents and by disposing of Mrs. Silverman. On July the 5th, 1998, one of Mrs. Silverman's maids reported her missing. Uh, we don't know where this woman is, wherever she is. I pray to God she's all right. That same day, Shantae and Kenny were arrested on an unrelated fraud charge. Detectives then found paperwork belonging to Irene Silverman including a forged deed to her townhouse in the Kimes' belongings and weapons in their car. Suddenly, the pair were linked to her disappearance and other crimes. Meantime, in Los Angeles, police want to question them in the murder of David Kasdan. Authorities say Kasdan transferred his home to the Kimes before being killed. And in the Bahamas, authorities want to question the Kimes in connection with the disappearance of a banker. I was talking about Irene Silverman, I had no idea who she was, never heard of her, anything. Then they talked about the bank in the Bahamas, I had no idea. It didn't click with me about the timing with, with my daughter at the airport and stuff. But David Kasdan was a family friend for a number of years. I saw David Kasdan's name and Murr in the same sentence. And I just like, oh man. Um, I knew they did it. It wasn't a question of myth, maybe, I knew it. It's all not true. I mean, there's no truth to any of this. On the 14th of February 2000 in New York City, Shantae and Kenny Kimes faced trial for the murder of Irene Silverman. Jurors rendered a guilty verdict for Shantae and Kenneth Kimes after four days of deliberating. I just, the wave of emotion, the only thing bigger was the fear, or not the fear, the feeling of relief. And I got criticized for saying that before. You know, your mother and brother in jail for murder, you feel relieved. <laughs> so you don't know the life I lived up to that point, you know? It hit me so bad. I literally, like, can't remember, like, certain parts of my life. I would have dreams or nightmares and I would be like, oh, that was a horrible nightmare. But then I would realize that they were actually memories. Even in jail for murder, Shantae never stopped professing her innocence. British journalist John Marquis went to interview her. When I met her in prison, the only crime she ever admitted to was actually stealing lipstick when she was a young girl. Uh, and I put all the other accusations to her she denied knowing Mr. Ahmed for a start, and uh, she claimed that Kasdan was a great friend of hers. So she was in total denial of all these things. The Kimeses are now facing extradition to California. They're accused of murdering a 63-year-old L.A. businessman after he discovered the two used his name to obtain a $280,000 mortgage. I got on a plane to New York, and went to the prison where they were holding Kenny. This place felt like a dungeon. And uh, behind a wire mesh, no plexiglass, uh, my brother was sitting there. You know, it was the first time I'd seen him in a long time. And I had rehearsed for, uh, 
a six hour flight, how I was going to talk Kenny and to turn against mom to avoid the, the death sentence out here in Los Angeles. And I was ready for a fight. And I told him, Kenny, this, this attach of the hip stuff's got to stop. It's going to cost you your life. You're going to have to cooperate. And he says, I'm ready to cooperate. It was a murder confession. I know it sounds strange, because like I said before, I knew they were guilty. But to hear it straight from him, there's nothing that could have prepared me for that. It's one thing to read about a family member and say, these are the facts and this is what happened. But to come face to face with your flesh and blood must have a huge impact on Kent. Because let's not forget, these are his family members. He is also part of that story. He can't separate from that. They sent me into the visiting room, and there's mom. And uh, I think it was the first time in my life I saw her outside the house without makeup. I sat down, you know, and once again, pleasantries, and, and I said, I saw Kenny. You know, I just saw him yesterday. Oh, it's so horrible what they're doing to him and stuff. I said, no, Mom, he did it. He, okay, it's real. And then we started talking about the castle trial coming up. I said, Mom, you can't fight this thing. Oh, we're going to win that one. We didn't do that. I said, you're, you're going to kill Kenny. You're going to kill your, your youngest son to keep this up. And then... I lost my anger management because she uh, made a mistake. She said, we're innocent, Kent. I'm so innocent. I swear, I swear in the life of little Carson. And I blew up. Yeah, I jumped out of my chair. I want to try to put my hand through it, but I hit the plexiglass. And then the guard behind me stood up real quick. And I just told her, don't you ever, ever, ever do that again. It's my son. Don't swear on his life, ever. I was out of there in, in a half hour. I could not stand being in the same room with her. Kenny kept his promise to Kent. At the trial for the murder of David Kasdan, he confessed, admitting that they'd killed him and the banker, Mr. Ahmed. The plea deal was life in prison for him and taking uh, execution off the table for mom and him, as long as he confessed to everything. When Babish was in prison, um, you know, I, I wrote her one letter. I found Jesus Christ and accepted him into my heart. And I got really happy and excited about it, and I wanted to share that with her. Um, when she wrote me back, she said that she had to. And I was reading the letter, I was super happy, super excited, like it was horrible that she was in there, but at least, you know, there was some faith and hope. But then towards the end of the letter, she was talking about me contacting someone and that I would get $10,000 if I did it. When I read that part, I was done. It just it just hit me like this this has just got to stop. This is this is hurting me. It's kind of funny cuz I found out so much stuff about my family's tragedies through the internet. Um, came home from work and my routine was I was to check the internet and see what's going on. And I got the email from the prison she was at. And I went, uh-oh, because I uh, never got one before from her. And I Googled Shantae Kimes and found out she died that day. With my uncle, I didn't know how to talk to him, um, but I didn't believe 
that he was capable of murder. I didn't believe it, but um, actually about almost a year ago, um, I just like, I was praying a lot and I was like, you know, I wonder if I could just maybe try and write him, just kind of get an idea. And I did, and I, you know, I gave him my number and he called me and it actually went really, really well. Um, I still talk to him off and on, even today. And then recently, you know, he said something like, I'll never forget. Um, he said, you know, Christina, don't feel bad that I'm in here. He's like, I'm a killer and I deserve to be here. And when he said that, I was just, it, uh, there's, even right now, like the pit of my stomach, like I feel like I just went down in the world's tallest roller coaster. You know, I still catch myself wondering if I could have done something to prevent this. On mom, no way. It was a freight train vertical. Kenny, I might have. You know, I don't know. One thing I tell everyone, I try to teach my kids, you know, why do you... <sighs> why do you do the right thing? And everyone thinks it's a complicated answer. It's not. It's because it's the right thing to do. Plain and simple. Babish did horrible things trying to bring my dad up to get into it with what she was doing. He never wanted to. He was uncomfortable with it, you know. Um, he didn't follow her way, thank God. But unfortunately, when she did that with my uncle, he, he gave in and went the wrong way. But um, I'm really proud of my dad. I'm really, really proud of him. I found out that Kenny was uh, in a transfer to a prison in San Diego. It was an hour and a half drive from my house. I'm, I haven't been there, and I don't intend to. I mean, I love him, but at the same time, we're not the same people. They're my family, and, you know, the world um, looks at them as these horrible, evil, evil, evil people. And they definitely did some evil things, but they weren't like that 24-7. So they were my family, and I, I love them very much, and I know that they loved me too.